So Nitin, um, tell me a little bit about your journey with diabetes. Diabetes was first diagnosed, I think I was 32 or something. You were young. Yeah, yeah. All right. And how about your weight? Were you like by any means obese or overweight at the time? I wasn't obese by any, any means, I would say. And I was, I wouldn't say overly active. I mean, I was decently active. But as I said, I like to eat food. Yeah, and you know, what the story that you, you talk about, young, low BMI, eating, but not making great choices, but moderately active, is a typical kind of profile that we see with like most South Asians who get diagnosed with type two diabetes. Your body makes insulin to handle blood sugars. And insulin is needed to push the sugar into the cells to act as fuel. So when you have insulin resistance, there's a block to that insulin working on your cells to push that glucose in. And when we talk about diabetes in South Asians, we're not the typical, you know, obese diabetes. We're called the lean diabetes for a reason. We have bad insulin resistance, and we also have insulin deficiency as well. So we don't make enough insulin. Oh. Whatever insulin we make, it doesn't work effectively. We're born with this to begin with, and when you add a higher BMI, weight, lifestyle, lack of activity, and poor food choices, that combination really puts us at a much higher risk. Over a period of time, I found out that I needed to go to a specialist, a doctor, who kind of knew what my, what my ethnicity was, what my background was, and who, who knew what my struggles were. She had exactly the same kind of background that I did. And um, I mean, it was a little bit shocking when I heard that you had diabetes too, but it really helped me that you have been through the exact same pains and you know what I'm struggling with. You know, when I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes, a form of diabetes you get during pregnancy, they were giving me the usual pasta, potato, don't eat this diet. And I'm like, you know what? I don't eat this kind of stuff, <laughs> right? I may right. eat it once in a while, but that's not what my diet is. So I really need some help to right. tell me, someone to tell me what I can and cannot eat. And I like eating Indian food. That's what I grew up eating. And I'm not going to suddenly stop eating that and start eating salads three times a day. That's just not who I am. So keeping our flavor profile is very important. And we've worked together about how do you reduce the amount of carbs in your food, not eliminate it, right? Like I'm not, I don't ask people to stop eating rice, stop eating roti. You just can't eat Indian food without that. And that's just the reality. So like, for example, um, making rotis with avocado, right? Yeah. Ripe avocados, mixing, you know, wheat flour with it and adding whatever spices you want, you can maintain the flavor profile, the texture of chapatis and rotis, yet you're reducing the carbs, adding fiber, adding essential fatty acids, and really making your food nutrient rich. You know, idlis, right? Idlis are like rice cakes. So after getting married, my wife started preparing it. But uh, we knew it's from rice, and that's what, you know, jacks up the, uh, the sugar in the, in the bloodstream. So uh, over the years, she's come up with her own recipe of mixing totally rice-free, but mixing other pulses and other stuff. So right now, you won't believe it, every three days, I'm eating four idlis in the morning for breakfast, which is like heaven for me. I can't even tell you how, how much that. I think your, your wife needs to start a YouTube channel on how to <laughs> eat healthy with diabetes. Picking up the same thread of sustainability and being practical, um, I want to talk about uh, being physically active. So what works for me, and I love that, is walking. I'm so proud to tell you I walk every day. I try to walk 10,000 steps every day. Beautiful. Which is approximately five miles, as we know. I'm always a big advocate of no siesta after fiesta. <laughs> so don't sit down after you eat, right? That's the time your muscles are going to absorb the yeah, most of the sugar. Yeah. So, and I've told you this in clinic as well, that I'm like, walk or do some physical activity after you after eat. Eating. But sometimes patients are really pushing themselves to doing the right thing. And despite that, we're not seeing the kind of benefit that we would see in other ethnic groups. That's when it tells me that we're really fighting a force that we can't fix with lifestyle changes. So we give medications that reduce insulin resistance and allow your insulin to work longer and more effectively. And you and I have done you just, yeah. yeah, this is like Nitin's story. Right, right. Yeah. 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 He is like a picture perfect patient yeah. who will do everything you tell him. And despite that, <laughs> it's just, you know, sometimes it is a fight and you know, you also have to live your life. Yeah. And we've talked about it that when push comes to shove and we're really pushing everything we can, sometimes there's a, there's a stronger wall to push and it's just the genetics that we can't fight, right? So one more question I wanted to ask you, doctor, is um, who should be screened for diabetes and when should they be screened for? What's the criteria that 
we decide on? Our metrics are a little different than general, say, Caucasians, African Americans. We're at a much higher risk than most others. So if you have a BMI that's greater than 23, if you're above 35, if you have a first degree relative who has a history of diabetes, if you have heart disease, hypertension, or high blood pressure, there are other things where your cholesterol is elevated. And if you have a history of gestational diabetes, PCOS, now, if you don't meet any of the above criteria, then if you're 35 and above and you're South Asian, you need to be screened for diabetes. The idea is that you keep your goal in sight and you're working towards it. Because right. guess what? It took you years to get where you are. It's going to take you years to get you where you want to be as well. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding that you're not in a race, there's no finish line that's going to end in a month. Right. There is a sense of purpose in this because when we do these things and we are able to share our experiences with others and we can relate to each other, I think we just become more compassionate towards each other, right?